There we go. All right, so we'll be recording so we can send this out for people that missed it. But um, Nate Mavis has been extremely kind and offering to give our first friendly tech space talk. And the point of this whole series that I wanted to start was to get remote people more involved that maybe aren't in Boston for our in-person meetups and just to give us a chance to brainstorm and talk about cool ideas, practice a conference talk if you want to, get feedback from, from other people in this group about uh, honestly anything that you want to share, whether it's an upcoming um, book. We have people publishing books and, and podcasts and all kinds of cool stuff. So uh, Nate is a writer and engineer at a biotech startup. He has academic backgrounds in math and philosophy and non-academic backgrounds in poker and podcasting, which is actually how I was introduced to him was via Angela Bassa, who is not here, who I'm going to send this link to later. But thank you, Angela, for bringing Nate to this community. Um, all right. Uh, so, Nate, I'm going to... So, we're, we're good? Yep. All right, so thank you everybody for coming and listening to this talk. It's the first one in the series, so I think we should keep the goals modest. Um, so in roughly half an hour here, uh, I'm going to take you from uh, from zero to curing cancer. That's the goal, is for you to be in a position to cure cancer after you hear this talk, um, or at least to help out a little bit in, in the overall combined algorithmic effort to cure cancer. Uh, I'm going to go for about half an hour, but please, 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 if anything I say is is not clear or if you're just stuck on some basic point, please feel free to uh, jump in chat and ask for a clarification. Um, if you have a more substantive question, we can save that for, for the end. Sorry, Nate, I just accidentally took your presenter privileges. Go, go ahead and take it back. That's okay. Well, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, All right, I'm, you, I'm going you, on mute and not clicking anything else. Go ahead. <laughs> all right, very good. So, and uh, we're back. Very good. All right, <clears throat> good. So uh, I'm going to tell you today about sequence bloom trees. And sequence bloom trees are here to solve what I want to call a subset inclusion problem. So here is a slightly simplified scenario. We have some query. I'm going to call it the target. Uh, this can be just a little transcript, a little bit of text. It can be anything we're, we're searching for, but especially a string. And we have a set of references. So I've listed three references below, and, and we can imagine that they're very long. And our question is this. Given a target and some references, R1, R2 through Rn, in which references does the target appear? We just need a yes or no answer for each of the references. So why do we care about this question? Um, the reason I care and the reason that we really, really care about even small speedups in trying to answer this question is bioinformatics. We have terabyte and petabyte scale databases of sequencing data. This is a real thing. Uh, this is an actual application that's happening now. And we ask questions like, which of these 250 experiments turned up this transcript? So. Here is a little bit of, you know, a little nucleic acid sequence. Um, when we sequenced a bunch of people with colorectal cancer, did this turn up? When we sequenced a bunch of people of this descent, did it turn up? And so on. And these 250 experiments will all be in one big database that is searchable, but it's so big that you want to search it really quickly. So that's an actual application. It's what's actually driving the development of this algorithm, but you can imagine using it all over the place. So let's say, for example, baseball. If you believe uh, MLB Advanced Media's press releases, they're generating roughly seven terabytes of data per game, roughly 2,500 games per year. And you could imagine asking questions like, in which of these games did an event like this happen? You know, Where do I need to look if I want to see a ball going exactly this fast or a player in exactly this, this position? And that's just conjectural. I'm just making that up. But the idea is it's a very general question, and we would like to be able to answer it efficiently. Another reason to care is that the answer is awesome. Uh, this is, I think, a really elegant uh, data structure. Um, a lot of there, there's a cool little intellectual tradition behind it. It's a wonderful case study in algorithmic optimization. There are all sorts of little questions you need to answer even after you get the basic idea down. Uh, third, it's a hot research topic in bioinformatics. 
So it's, it's something that's at the cutting edge. Right now, people are publishing, people are publishing preprints, people are furiously trying to test all this stuff. It's something that's going on right now. And it has a lot of unanswered questions. So you, yes you, can internalize the stuff, read the preprints, and help cure cancer if you so choose. Right, so let's think about answers to the subset inclusion problem. The first one is, I think, pretty intuitive. Let's say that uh, your references are all strings and the thing you're searching for is also a string. Well, you can stick all those strings together into one big long string. That's what I'm doing with the little colored stuff at the top half of the screen. And then use your favorite exact or inexact string searching algorithm to find inexact or exact matches in the concatenated reference. And this could be uh, Smith Waterman or any of the zillions of descendants of Smith Waterman, or it could be something like Boy or Moore, or it could be anything. And uh, you could imagine finding all the matches in the concatenated reference. And I've marked those with X's in the in the illustration there. And then once you have the matches, once you know exactly where those matches are, you can see which of the subsets have matches. So here, uh, reference one would get a yes answer, reference two would get a no answer, reference three would get a yes answer. Yes, no, yes. So we would have solved the subset inclusion problem uh, by treating it as a string matching problem. So is this a good solution to the subset inclusion problem? Well, yes, if your total reference length isn't too big. Um, if you're using something like Boy or More, you should be able to do that in roughly linear time. The algorithmic complexity of Boy or More is not an easy thing to describe quickly, but it's, you know, linear, sublinear-ish most of the time. Um, Smith Waterman is, you know, n log n, uh, so it takes longer. <laughs> um, or, sorry, n squared, but that's a different thing. Um, it's also a good solution if you're going to need to know the match location anyway. So that would be another reason to solve the problem this way. Uh, but no, if all we need to do is answer the subset inclusion problem and if a linear time search is going to take too long. And this is going to be the case in many of the bioinformatics applications uh, that I, I mentioned. Um, again, we're working at terabyte, petabyte scale, and even a linear time or even a sublinear time algorithm is going to be uh, way too long, or at least it's going to be expensive or long enough that we would really like to do better. So what went wrong by solving the problem this way? Um, well, the, the sort of obvious intuitive thing went wrong. We did a lot of extra work. We only asked for the subsets. We only wanted a yes or no answer uh, to, for, for every uh, reference for each of the three. But instead, we went and we found the precise positions. So we did, we generated a lot of extra information. We did a lot of extra work. Uh, a less important reason is that Boyer Moore won't work so well in bioinformatics. This is just an aside, but um, we won't even get particularly good performance out of Boyer Moore because the speed ups that it offers rely on um, a using a relatively large alphabet and a relatively non-repetitive sequence. And bioinformatics is full of very repetitive strings over very short alphabets, four-letter alphabets to be exact. But that's a different issue. So we can do better than this. Uh, so here's a second way to try to answer the subset inclusion problem. We can iterate over sets. And we can motivate this uh, in, I think, a fairly intuitive way. So first, we can do set inclusion quickly. Uh, set inclusion is a really well-studied problem. Moreover, the subset inclusion problem that I laid out is just a bunch of set inclusion problems stuck together. So why don't we just cut up the subset inclusion problem into a bunch of set inclusion problems? Like we had three references before, let's just solve the set inclusion problem three times. Seems like a good idea. So why can we do set inclusion quickly? We have bloom filters. Uh, here's the basic idea of a bloom filter. If you don't know what it is, I'm going to tell you what it is now. 
if you do know what it is, feel free to go get a cup of tea or something. But uh, there may be, I'm also going to ask you to think about the structure of bloom filters and, and recognize that it has this cool property that you might not have appreciated before. Certainly I hadn't. So you might want to pay attention anyway. So here's the idea of a bloom filter. We start with a bit vector of all zeros. And when we insert an item into the filter, we take n predefined hash functions. We run the item through each one of those hash functions. And for each function, we, we turn on the bit in the bit vector corresponding to f of s, the value of the hash function. I've got a picture for this in a second. Um, and then when we do membership testing, we run the item through all the hash functions again, the same ones. We get the relevant values and we go look at the bit vector to see if the relevant bits are turned on. If they are all turned on, we get a maybe or probably or almost certainly answer. If, and so it's a probabilistic algorithm. If any one of them fails, if any one of those bits is turned off, we get a certain no answer. I've got a picture for this coming soon. So if, uh, if a picture will help, just hang on for a second. Uh, first, I need to pay a small debt. Uh, it may seem that I've committed a type error just now. So earlier I was talking about strings, um, but now I'm talking about sets. And I've gone from uh, doing string matching uh, in one breath to doing sub, uh, set testing in a second breath. So why is, why is this okay? Um, it's because we have all these methods to treat strings as sets. And so if we have a really good, fast method for doing set membership testing, we can apply that to the case of, of strings, when strings are the things that we're searching for. So the, the, the way that we usually do it in bioinformatics is as follows. We take, uh, we chop the strings up into k-mers, or in fact, we take every single k-mer that appears in the string, and we treat those as the set elements. So if the string that we want to turn into a set is T A G G A T C A and so on, we take the first five mer T A G G A and the second five mer A G G A T and so on. And we stick and, and we represent the string as the set of all those five mers. So reference one is one set, reference two is another set, and the combined reference is the, the union of sets and adjusted for like the overlapping ones, but that usually doesn't cause problems. So that is why I can talk about set matching uh, at one time and subset testing at another time and why there's some sort of correspondence between those. Back to bloom filters. Here's a picture of what happens when we insert an item into a bloom filter. So we start with a big vector of all zeros. When we insert S, and S can be any hashable item, it can be any item that you can run through hash functions. Suppose that the first hash function applied to S gives you three, the second one applied to S gives you 15, and the third one applied to S gives you four. So your relevant values uh, for S are three, four, and 15. We go to the bit vector and we turn on the bits at three at, at places three, four, and 15. Then later when we are testing for S rather than inserting it, we look at the same hash functions, run S through those hash functions again. We get the same values, three, four, and 15, and we check to see if those, uh, those bits in the bit vector are indeed turned on. So we would look, we would see that there's a one at position three, a one at position four, and a one at position 15 and we would get a positive test, which again corresponds to a maybe or probably or almost certainly answer. Um, and there are, there's a big literature here on how to choose your uh, hash functions and how to choose the length of the bit vector, et cetera, um, to you know, sort of get the best of both worlds, to be able to do this really quickly and to minimize your chances of a false positive. Big literature here. But the core of the idea is that when we're inserting items, we are uh, turning zeros to ones in a bit vector. And then when we are checking for set membership, we are checking to see if the relevant bits are turned on. Um, it's a cool idea. It's very powerful. 
And what's nice is that it's really, really fast. So again, our first attempt took linear-ish time in the size of the combined reference. Um, the second attempt is way faster. Bloom filter checks take constant time, at least if you're using a hash function that can be computed in constant time. So uh, at the scales discussed earlier, this is much, much faster. It's linear in the number of subsets, not their total size. So again, in the actual bioinformatics uh, application that I, I mentioned earlier, where you have you know, roughly hundreds of experiments sitting in a database that's enormous, um, yeah, it's going to be the order of the value that is like between two and 300 in some uh, real world examples. So that's, that's pretty cool. That's a, that's a much faster method. And um, so, we've, so we've improved upon our first attempt. But we can do even better. And again, at the scales that we see in bioinformatics, we should want to do better. And to see how we can do better, we can uh, think of Bloom filters as establishing a correspondence between sets of items on the one hand and bit vectors on the other. So again, on the left, we have R1, R2, and R3. By chopping them up into k-mers, we can treat those as sets. So we have a correspondence between sets on the left and bit vectors on the right. So a question, what happens when we test each of two references for the same target T? Well, we are going to run through T through the hash functions. We are go like, we're going to test V1 for those bits. So in our example, we're gonna look at places three, four, and 15 in V1. And then we're going to test V2 for those very same bits, three, four, and 15. Uh, and this means that we can do something cool if we want to test uh, for the union of sets simultaneously. Let's say we want to ask not is T and R1 and then separately is T and R2, but what if we want to test immediately to see if uh, T is in the union of R1 and R2? Well, that means we can just take the bitwise OR and we'll get a few more false positives, but you know, if we construct our hash functions and if we take care of some of the technical details behind the scenes, well, we won't add too many false positives, but we'll be able to test for the union just in one go because, again, we're looking for the bits at the same indices when we test each of the individual bit vectors. So on the left, I'm imagining doing a sort of set union or string concatenation, depending on how you want to think about it. And on the right, we see that we don't need to go back and, and uh, construct a whole new bit vector for that from scratch. We can just do a bitwise OR on the Bloom filters. And then we get another Bloom filter representing or approximately representing with maybe a few more false positives, the set union. And that's really cool. That helps a lot. This right here is the core insight behind a sequence Bloom tree. It's what's, what's going to make everything else work. Why does it make everything else work? Why does it help? Well, we can iterate the procedure of finding a bit vector for a union of sets. And that means that we can do binary search on the subsets by putting the bit vectors representing the subsets at the leaves of a binary search tree and filling in the nodes above them. So we can start with four sets. And if we don't want to iterate through all four of them, we can, uh, above them, put uh, the, the union of S1 and S2 here, and the union of S3 and S4. And then above them, we can put the union of all four, and we can start the search there. So let's say that the thing we're looking for is not in any of the four sets. We're going to get a no answer immediately, probably. We might get a false positive, in that which case we might have to look down the tree a little bit farther. But we're going to save so much redundant work when. Um, in a lot of cases when we're going to get negative results. Very powerful. Here's a little bit of pseudocode uh, for searching the tree. Initialize the queue to just the root node. While you have anything left in the queue, pop an arbitrary item out of the queue and store it in the current node. Test the bit vector there. If your test comes back positive, 
then if where you are is a leaf, then you're done. You have a positive result at, at one of the, the sets of interest, one of the subsets that, that, you're, that you're examining in the question. You can just add that to the solution set. That's just part of your answer. Otherwise, if it's not a leaf, then you need to keep searching down in the tree and add its children to the queue. Uh, I think it's easier to see pictorially. So you start the search at the, uh, at the root. If you get a no answer, you're done. Otherwise, you have to search both of the children. And whenever you search any node, if you get a yes answer, you keep searching with the children. If you get a no answer, you can prune off that whole subtree. Again, that's the key. You get to prune whole subtrees when you get no answers. And this will happen fairly often in a lot of uh, real world examples. So quickly taking stock of where we are. The first approach was linear-ish in the total size of what we're searching through. The second approach is linear in the number of subsets. And the sequence bloom tree approach is logarithmic in the number of subsets. You shouldn't ignore the constants, but empirically there's a very good speed up, speed up uh, for the n is roughly 250 case mentioned before. And if you want to see some of those empirical results, I will give you links to papers at the end. So I glossed over um, some of, of, I've glossed over a few things. So you have the basic idea. I'm going to talk about um, a few of the things that need to be tweaked when we're trying to optimize this data structure and this algorithm. Um, so when the things that we're testing are strings in the string case, which is again, what we have in the bioinformatics uh, case, how exactly do we test the nodes? Well, this is going to be domain and context specific. Uh, people disagree about this. It's an area of active research. But the basis of one promising approach, and I'll give you the references later, is to test all the relevant k-mers in the query. So uh, the, the query I gave at the beginning was, I think, uh, Gattaca cat. If we cut that up into five mers, we'll get G-A-T-T-A-C-A-C-A-T. It's 10 long. We'll get six five mers. And we test the node for all six of those five rows. And if at least seven of them, at least X percent of them test positive, the query is considered to test positive. So you, you have some extra error tolerance there. And then this X that we get with X percent, that's just a parameter of the algorithm in this case. Another thing we need to think about is how to arrange the leaves. So the guiding intuition behind this aspect of, of tuning the algorithm or the data structure is this. The more similar nearby leaves are, the better. Uh, the fewer false positives we are going to get at intermediate nodes and the more subtrees we can prune out early. So let's take a, just a toy example. Suppose our target appears in S1 and S2, but not S3 or S4. So the best answer to our subset inclusion problem is going to be yes, yes, no, no. Then let's imagine that we've arranged them in a tree the way we did before. So at the bottom of the tree, we get the yes, yes, no, no. <clears throat> when we examine S1 union S2, well, that's gonna be positive. We're gonna get a positive result there. When we go to the, the, the top of the tree, S1 union S2, union S3, union S4, we're gonna get a, we're gonna get a positive result there also. But S3 union S4, that's probably going to be negative. And that's really good because that means that we are spared the work of examining the S3 and S4 bit vectors directly. So that's a good thing. And the idea is that if we switch S2 and S3 in the tree, then what happens? S1 positive, S3 negative, S2 positive, S4 negative. S1 union S3, we're gonna get a positive result. But S2 union S4, that's also gonna be a positive result. So we have to do extra searches in that case. So the idea is that we get a worse result because we put dissimilar sets next to each other. So what exactly do we mean, do we mean by dissimilar sets and, and how do we efficiently construct a data structure so that they uh, wind up next to each other? Well, Nobody knows, and this is where the community can use help. Um, one approach is a greedy algorithm. 
so you just sort of keep a like an ordered list of filters and then when you're creating the data structure you insert each new filter next to the one it most closely resembles so it's a greedy approach and closeness is here defined using the Hamming metric for results using this approach see Solomon and Kingsford 2013 I'll give you that uh, that reference at the end uh, for another approach that I can't summarize quickly because it's way more complicated, uh, you can see a preprint from 2016, and I will give you that reference also. But again, um, one of the fun things is that if we get the leaves close together, uh, if we get similar sets close together as leaves in the tree, we can we can do better. We can prune more of the subtrees more quickly, uh, save more work, and and speed this up. And here are your references. Um, I think that a lot of this stuff about hacking bloom filters by sort of noticing that you can, um, that they have structure that supports like union and things like that. Um, I think that goes back to Krasno 2013. And I think she was working on distributed data. I think she was working on databases. Uh, I haven't read this paper super closely, um, but I think the ideas at least partly trace back um, to her work or through her work. In bioinformatics, this sort of got um, a big boost in 2013 when Solomon and Kingsford introduced sequence bloom trees, this, this data structure I've been talking about. The, they, they published it in Nat Biotech. You can go read the paper, and uh, I'll be happy to send out links to all of these um, in, in any form that you want. You know, in Slack or in email or anything. But um, these are some papers where you can read about this stuff. And again, it's cutting edge. Uh, it looks like, again, really empirically, this does speed things up. And when you have, say, 250 experiments over a huge, that combined for a huge data set, even doing 250 constant time checks for everything that you're going to want to check is going to be very slow, or not very slow, but you can do better by uh, arranging all those bloom filters into a tree. Um, so that is that is a very short introduction to sequence bloom trees. I, I hope it was intelligible, and uh, I will be very happy to field questions. Awesome! Thanks so much, Nate. That was that was awesome. Um, uh, again, totally new topic to me. So this was actually really insightful to at least start understanding some of the basics. And we have a question, actually, from Brian. Um, I'll, I can unmute him, too, in case there's a dialogue. But his initial question was, how do these unions work or scale when the number of leaves is huge? Uh, they So each, right, so when the number of leaves is huge, so if you have n leaves, you're going to, uh, uh, let's say n is a power of 2. Um, if you have n leaves in a binary tree, you're going to get n minus 1 nodes that are not leaves. So you're going to need to do n minus 1 unions of, of bloom filters, or, or n minus 1 bitwise or operations in, in the bloom filters, and that's going to be really fast. Um, so yeah, so you have to do more work when you're constructing the sequence bloom trees, but again, as the number of leaves gets huge, then then that speed up you get from iterating through all n bloom filters on the one hand, or going through a binary search tree and, and doing it in logarithmic time on the other hand, that also gets better. I, I'm not sure I answered exactly your question though, so please feel free to ask something else if, if I didn't if I didn't answer it right. Yeah. No, um, I'll let Brian, he can type in chat again if he has a follow-up, but we have, in the meantime, um, another question. Unless, Brian, if you want to follow up with voice, you can do that right now. Go ahead. Um, you can, I'll, I'll, I'll type my question because it's going to take me a minute to word it. So. Okay, we'll go to the next one. We'll come back to you. Cool. Um, so we have another question from Will Dugan. He wants to... Can you explain again how one chooses K in determining the K MERS? Is there an optimal K in general? That's an awesome question. Yeah, that's great. Nobody knows. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there, I, I think it's going to be context specific. Um, 
Yeah, I think K equals 11 has been used in some <laughs> bioinformatics applications with 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 uh, with good result. But um, like the number of times that people have actually built sequence bloom trees and and tested them on real queries that you might actually want to do, and then publish the results, um, can be counted on like one or two or maybe three hands. So. We, we don't know exactly what, what the right K is going to be. It's going to depend on like how many, how often you get mutations and, and things like that. Can, um, can you and, do, you know. it's, I have a, sorry to like interrupt, but I think maybe, I mean, this is completely from coming from my gene set enrichment days, like could you do a permutation test where you, you randomly shuffle the data and you keep alt increasing K until you start to get, until you stop getting or start getting uh, significant results, right? So you can do like a kind of permutation test in that sense with random data. Uh, that's interesting. That sounds like a good idea. <laughs> that, that <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, it seems to be like a way, like anytime I'm trying to set up like set any kind of parameter, it's like, well, give it fake data. And if it's giving you significant results, it's probably not what you want to do. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um... That seems that seems like a good approach. Um, I think it, it's I, I think that's a, a good way to go about things. I think it's also going to depend on how long your your search terms are. So like how long your transcripts are. I think in at least one paper, the things that they were searching for were like forty one characters long, and um, it could yeah, be really. So, sometimes it can be a really slow way to. You know, determine those parameters. Yeah, um, but if you get like if you cut a a, a forty one mer into what thirty eleven mers thirty one eleven mers um, and and if if you know all but one or two of them come back positive, I mean if they all come back positive, you you can be pretty sure um, under certain assumptions that 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 forty two mer is is in is in the thing you're looking for. Um, but that's just a long way of saying I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's a good question. All right, um, back to Brian. So once you do your first set of unions, do you keep making more unions until you get the full union, or do you just make that first set only? Uh, you make, great question. You make more and more unions until you get the full union. Yeah, you keep going. So like in this case, you just have like n equals four. So I took the union of S1 and S2, and then S3 and S4, and then I took the union of those two unions. And you just keep going until you get um, the union of everything. That's going to be your root node. And again, like that's going to let you get negative results really, really fast. And um, yeah, that, that, the, the fact that you iterate the procedure, that's what gives you like the recursive structure that lets you put everything into a tree. That, that, that's what lets you do binary search on everything. And that's what gives you uh, the logarithmic time instead of the linear time. Yeah. So thanks, thanks for uh, thanks for asking that question. It's a it's an important point. Awesome. I think that gotcha makes sense. So great. Uh, Dan Schmutz has a question. I'm going to let him talk and ask you. Go for it, Dan. Okay. Hey, I'm unmuted. Thanks. Thanks for uh, putting this on, Tanya, and um, to the speaker. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. Um, I'm not that familiar with it, so my question is more of a kind of a high-level question just to understand how best to apply this, um, maybe pass it along to uh, my brother who does a lot of genomics work. Um, I wanted to ask, in the, essentially the, the tree search is really a way of kind of, uh, I guess, quickly winnowing out the ones that don't match, in a sense, so that you can focus on the ones that are important. Is that, is that a, a good summary? Like yeah, that's a, each other? yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great, that's a great summary. And, and if you don't want to think about the tree, you can just imagine doing like a two stage thing where on the one hand you, you, uh, you have N membership tests. So like here four, where on the one hand you have all four uh, bloom filters there waiting to be tested and, and you, you're going to scan through them. But you can imagine doing like a first stage where you have a bloom filter representing the whole thing. So no, no intermediate levels. You could imagine just doing like a quick first pass to just say, hey, if this is going to be a negative result, I want to find out quickly and, and doing 
um, doing that quick first pass, and then if it comes back yes, then scanning and doing the whole iterative uh, approach. That would be a sort of much more coarse-grained version of, of the sequence bloom tree idea, it, it, but it would still help a lot, and precisely for the reason you said. It's, it's, it's a way of like winning, winning out your negatives at an early stage before you do the work of searching every single set uh, for, for the, the item. So yeah, I think, okay. I, I think that's it. Is that, is that useful? Yeah, it, it is. And then the, the second part of my question, which is, is a little bit more perhaps about the basis of the, the, the bloom filtering itself, is the reason why this is faster is essentially this hashing process. Um, uh, you, could take, you could take an arbitrary length uh, function or a string or function numbers, whatever, and then by running it through the hash function, I guess if there's a match, it should come up. I mean, there should be a consistent outcome, and that's a faster process than some sort of text matching algorithm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's another. That's something I I, I glossed over a, a little bit, and I'm sorry for that. Um, yeah, hash functions are just functions where you put something in and you get a number out, and a lot of them are really really fast, and that's that's the important part. So the things that you're hashing can be anything. They can be strings, they can be other numbers, they can be, I don't know, they could be pictures, they could represent really anything. Um, but the idea is you have some fast process where you put a thing in and you get a number out. Um, gotcha. And, 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 and it, as long as you get the same answer every time, it's gonna work. So, uh, you know, it, it's like, I mean, passwords are one uh, uh, application of, yeah. I've, 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 yeah. But in oh, order to get that match, you, you would have to end up, uh, the other uh, questioner asked, you would have to end up hitting it right on, on how you split up your data set, is that right, with the, with the NMERS? Yeah, so if you, um, yeah, if you cut it up into KMERS, so, so when we inserted uh, the items, we would insert them using the hash function, and when we are, so let's say we have this big data set. So we go, we find a bunch of people with colorectal cancer, we sequence them, we take their genomes, and, and, and we create a bloom filter representing everything that we found. And let's say that we took, that we built it using uh, 20 MERS. Every, so every sequence of 20 letters that we found in somebody's genome from that data set, that's represented in the set. And um, so when we look for a transcript, the transcript might be um, longer than 20 letters, but the things that we can test for are just 20 letter subsequences. So, uh, okay. so yeah, so, and, and, that's, and that's just sort of X hypothesized. It takes a while to build these blue filters. So um, yeah, so, so what we have is like a sort of magical machine where if you put in a 20 letter sequence, it'll spit out an answer. Either we definitely didn't find that 20 letter sequence in the whole data set, or we maybe probably almost certainly did. Um, so yeah, so if, but if you're searching for something that's longer than that, you can just feed in every 20 letter subsequence and see how many yeses you get, and then go from there. Gotcha, thank you so much for your time. I'll go back to mute then. Oh uh, yeah, hey, thanks for the question, and thanks, and thanks for listening. Yeah, no, awesome questions, guys. Uh, Got time for a couple more. Um, throw it in the chat, or I can unmute you. I think this was really awesome, Nate. This was a great talk, and obviously, with there's a lot of good questions. Um, here's a here's a question coming in late while my dog actually harasses me. Um, <laughs> Pat Brophy says, "I came in late, but are you running these computations or just figuring out the optimal algorithm? If so, what kind of hardware are you using?" Um, so I'm just describing the data structure in general. Um, the, yeah, the stuff is huge. It runs <laughs> on the cloud. Uh, it's on some AWS instances, I think, in actual applications, or I guess in the Solomon and Kingsford case, on some cluster they have a Carnegie Mellon, I think. Um, yep. Yeah, but I'm just describing the data structure now. And um, the hardware side of it is, A, something I don't know much about, and be something that could definitely, definitely, definitely uh, be studied. And um, 
and while I'm talking, I want to say thank you to Tanya for for letting me give this talk. It was it was a it's it's cool to be able to to do this, and uh, thanks for everything you do with Friendly Tech Space. It's a it's a cool place. Well, thank you guys. You guys are what makes it awesome. Uh, it's really it was a selfish uh, idea of my own once I started out on my own and working remote to just be connected with uh, a bunch of people like you to just keep my brain in shape. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, talk to people when I'm remote, but yeah. Uh, so, re with regards to that last question, that's interesting. So is it um, is this algorithm is it something that can efficiently be parallelized, or is it is it very much like CPU bound, or like you know, is there a lot more work that should be done with with the, in the way that the algorithm is implemented in general? Yeah, I think yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think when when you're when people actually want to search through, say, big cancer data sets, um, they're going to be looking for tons and tons of transcripts at once. And I think the individual searches are definitely parallelizable. And I think some effort has gone into that. So, um, like, we want to see whether any one of these 5,000 transcripts has appeared in any one of these 250 experiments. Um, so each one of those searches will proceed as I described here, and I think those like 5,000 searches can be efficiently parallelized. Um, as for what other, excuse me, uh, parallelization opportunities there are, I, I don't know. I haven't thought much about that, and it's 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 not something I've thought much about. I think, yeah, I, I think the answer is. Excuse me. Um, yes, but I don't know exactly how. All right. Awesome. Well, all good questions, uh, you guys. Thanks for for hopping on after work. And Nate, of course, thank you so much. Pat, Pat says no. Thank you, Nate. And Mara says clap, <laughs> clap, clap, clap. She wanted to know if there's a clap emoji um, for go to meeting. <laughs> uh, it looks like Dan also wants to pass along the talk to to a few other people. So obviously, this was a, a hit. Um, but I'd love for other people to keep this going. Let's, I'm trying to do this at least once a quarter, maybe once every two months, just to keep our remote people involved. But, you know, I mean, whether you want to practice a conference talk or give any kind of talk on the topic of your choice, uh, please let me know. Just send me a message on Friendly Tech Space or email me or whatever. Um, but thanks, Nate, for being our, like, guinea pig. And uh, I finally caved and bought GoToMeeting as much as I didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry for the, the little bit of hiccups, but um, this was awesome. So I will uh, I'll send the recording around and thank you guys again. Um, yeah. Be sure to toss Nate some tacos in in Slack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. All right, guys, talk to you later. Bye.